Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to GearFest 2017. We're joined by a special guest, Jennifer Batten's here. Howdy. Great to see you. Glad to finally meet you instead of only seeing you on my laptop. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they squished me down to just fit on the, the whole screen. <laughs> so you did a, a, a workshop this morning. I did on the Fishman Triple Play wireless MIDI system. Nice. Yeah, it went well. Receptive audience. I love that system. Works yeah. Great. Yeah. No Plus, you can and... dance. You well, can dance in circles with it. Well, I, I wouldn't do that, but <laughs> <laughs> but it is a possibility. You're absolutely right. So you hold some pretty incredible distinctions. Um, I think that you've played for the largest audience ever, as far as guitar players go. Right, 1.5 billion people in, yeah, in 80 countries for the Super Bowl. Uh, 20, Super Bowl 26, I think. Incredible. Yeah, no pressure. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's something to have on your resume, though. That's it's it. the only time I, I think I ever saw Michael Jackson nervous. Is that right? He, yeah. It, it was very subtle, but, you know, I had worked with him for a number of years, so I just saw something was like, holy crap. <laughs> you know, no, no mistakes. That's amazing. In fact, there, there's one, one spot in that. The Super Bowl thing that's kind of funny because it's live and there's one point where we're both covered in fog and you can't see either of us. <laughs> so, <laughs> the beauty of live. Yeah, exactly. But that's your moment to kind of catch your breath, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Step back. You can't see me for just a second. Right. So I, I think uh, I first uh, came across you in Mike Varney's Spotlight column. Uh, wow. Guitar player. I, I, I loved it. The quote, if for some reason, things just stick with you, right? And the quote right? that stuck with me from that was your, you said something about wanting to bring more expressive portraits to the uh, the spot like oh i just i love that call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that was my national geographic cover i was kind of doing a gorilla pose <laughs> <laughs> so how did you uh, tell us about that how, what what drew you to the guitar and how did you get to that point where you had approached him up like in the column oh gosh uh what drew me to the guitar was jealousy my sister had a guitar and i didn't and that pissed me off oh, sure. when i was eight years old uh, i ended up getting my first guitar and back then it was kind of very odd to get an electric for your first guitar. Mm -hmm. But my dad bought me some Sears and Roebuck or something guitar, and it just looked so cool. It was red and black and bitching. Right. And I started taking lessons right away. Um, then I ended up with an acoustic guitar when I was 12 and uh, just progressed from there. I took lessons from a, a whole lot of different people. Mm -hmm. Every time the family would move, I'd end up with somebody else. So I started reading right off the bat, Mel mm -hmm. Bay book or something like that. and. The next teacher taught me finger picking, then the next guy was into blues, next one was into rock. and So I learned a lot of techniques and a lot of tunes, and then I took a test to get into what was then called GIT, Guitar Institute, before they added all the other instruments, and I flunked. Really? Yeah, because I had not been given the tools of the trade, like I didn't know harmonic minor, I didn't know uh, chord scales. Hmm. One of the things I was asked to play was a G major seven, and the only G I knew with a seven was first position, cowboy, G seven, dominant. Right. I didn't know the difference, so he sent me back to where I was living in San Diego, and I studied with a jazz player, Peter Sprague, mm -hmm. for six very intense months, and then was able to get back in then. Wow. And I totally didn't answer your second question because it just went that way. <laughs> oh, the, the spotlight column with Mike Mike. Oh, Marty. spotlight, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I had read that, and... Didn't think that much of it until my friend was in it. And I thought, damn, I want to be in it. Right. It was uh, Steve Lynch, who was in oh, my sure. class at GIT. Right, right. And From autograph. Yeah, yeah. Right. He was a huge influence. Mm -hmm. um, he got into tapping. That's the reason I got into tapping. Hmm. Th during that school year, there was a different seminar every month from the, all these heavy players, Larry Carlton, Lee Rittenauer, Pat Matheny, and Emmett Chapman came one month. And... You know, there were 60 students, 59 of us were, were thinking, you know, we got our hands full with guitar. We don't need a whole new tuning and a whole new instrument. But that's when Steve got the idea for tapping from mm -hmm. that. And I just looked in on him every once in a while to see what he was up to, and I knew I had to have some. Right. So uh, when school was out, I, I hooked up with him, learned a couple of his solos, and then just started experimenting from there. Right. And his approach was kind of scalar with the tapping on one string uh, kind of thing. Was that what you were doing early on, or were you doing more of the Van Halen thing? Where you He did that, and, and he, he also developed uh, a system where, for instance, if you play in A minor pentatonic fifth position, you can go up seven frets and play the exact same thing, which was E minor pentatonic, and just do the, the same fingering, same patterns. Mm -hmm. And it just, that just opened up a whole new thing for me. And I, I was not so much aware of Van Halen at that time. And we were graduating in 79, so he was just getting off the ground. Sure. Um, 
so I, I gravitated towards Steve's technique and then anybody that was doing it at that time, I, I started learning that stuff. Right, right, yeah. So how did you uh, end up connecting with Michael Jackson and having that, you, you did three tours with him, right? Yeah. Right, bad, history, and dangerous. dangerous. Yeah, yeah. it was all of his solo tours, really blessed. I never took for granted that he'd keep having me back, you know. Uh, but it bought me a house and studio and a wonderful way to see the world. Yeah, it's sure. Incredible. Sure. Because most tours, you've got a tour every day or you're traveling, and with him, it's two, three days a week. Uh, let's see, we're in Rome. I think I'll go to the Forum tomorrow, and day after tomorrow, maybe the Coliseum. Uh, nice. It was a paid vacation for sure. Right. Um, I, well, I had been teaching at GIT at the time that the, the Bad album came out, and one of his guys called up the school and said, send us two players, and I was one of the lucky people that got a call to go audition. Hmm. And there was something like 100 players asked yeah. to audition, correct? Yeah. Yeah. It, it wasn't a cattle call, like everybody waiting one after another. We all had appointments, so I didn't know till long after that there was that many people that auditioned. But a couple days later, um, there was no band. It was just you and a video camera. Just go. <laughs> wow. I think that the hardest part of the audition was at the end. He goes, "Okay, he wants to get an idea of your personality." So I thought, oh, <laughs> I like cats and nature, you know, <laughs> Sagittarius." Right. <laughs> um, but I, I started. Well, the only guidance I was given was to play some funky rhythm parts. <laughs> I mean, I had stayed home for a couple of days to learn his tunes but ended up not playing them. Um, and then I started just random soloing. I played, I had worked out a solo for Giant Steps mm -hmm. with tapping, I played that, and I had p been playing the Beat It solo in a cover band for a couple years. So that came in handy. I right. finished with that. Right, right. So did, did you ever, did he ever say or tell you what it was about you that, that made you come to the top of that list of 100 players? He did not, and I didn't ask him. Uh, I just left well enough alone. <laughs> but I'll tell you, there's there's a film coming out. I think it's called She Rocks. They might have changed the title. But it's a documentary on female guitar players that Steve Skorsky put together. And he tracked down the guy that actually had the film for the uh, original wow. uh, demo or audition from 1987. Uh -huh. And with the film, there was a piece of paper that, that Michael was making notes on and he put a couple stars next to my name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it worked out. That's awesome. I mean, That's he, awesome. they said, just come down and play with the band, see how it goes. And nobody ever said I had the gig. Huh. I had to get a passport and then there's a ticket to Tokyo. And I'm thinking, this is looking good. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Some clues there, right? Yeah, right. it went well. Right. So around that time, you also did your first uh, solo record, correct? With Michael yeah. Sandello producing? Yeah, I had done... Uh, three or four demo tracks before the Jackson thing, so I didn't finish the album until after the Bad Tour, mm -hmm. and it, it came out right before the Dangerous Tour, which worked out really well for promotion, because sure. all the travel was paid for, and I had days off to have press do uh, interviews and stuff. Yeah, right, right, right. So you had, uh, obviously, a lot of great music on that, but two that, uh, that I remember very well were uh, your version of Flight of the Bumblebee, mm. uh, which was really ripping. Thanks. And uh, at the time, I was working on it all picked. And so, oh, it was, so it was uh, interesting to hear your take on it with all, with all tapping was, uh, of course, way, way faster than I could ever do well, it. Well, you but know what? I think probably the fastest I could do picking is maybe 145, 150 at the metronome, and mm -hmm. getting rid of the pick, I could do 200. Right. So it was a massive difference. And it, it was really enlightening on how the right hand can slow you down. Mm -hmm. So get rid of that thing. Yeah, really. <laughs> what am I wasting my time on that for? <laughs> but you also did, you mentioned Giant Steps, and you did... Uh, uh, actually, two versions of that, right? You did a rock version and a jazz version of that. Yeah. Tell us about how you uh, mentally approach doing the same tune, with, especially with those kind of changes in two yeah. different styles like that. Well, I was really working out and intensely experimenting with tapping at that point. And I would go to the real book for harmony mm -hmm. um, to just maybe w work out doing arpeggios over a whole tune. And it just, uh, it's like one of those Mount Olymp Olympus things like, like Flay the Bumblebee. Here's a challenge. Let's we'll right. see if I can do it. And Giant Steps just seemed like a, it's kind of funny, but a fun thing to do at that <laughs> point. <laughs> but I, I will tell you that I stretch the changes out twice as long. So the two beat becomes four beat. Okay. Yeah. Still goes by really fast. Yeah, it does. And the jazz version was just Coltrane's 
um, solo. Mm -hmm. So I, I played that and then went into the rock thing. And Joe Pass actually saw me play it. Yeah? Yeah, which, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, he was uh, guesting at GIT and walked through the halls and, okay, I'm playing giant steps for Joe Pass. That's not a, ever going to happen again. <laughs> That's pretty great. Pretty great. It, it's interesting that uh, you did the first album and then you've done two solo albums since. And uh, the second solo album was very influenced by world music. And yeah. the third had much more of an electronica kind of a thing. You've kind of reinvented your, your musical genre that you're working in in all three of those albums. Was that something you were consciously doing or had you just evolved through the years into those different styles? Well, there were several years between records, so it was a natural evolution. Um, God, the first one was, was kind of like, here's what I can do. And it's kind of all over the map, with Fly of the Bumblebee and then Giant Steps and everything in between. The second one, I... I I'm really wor into world beat music mm -hmm. and having the opportunity to travel around the world with Michael Jackson, I just picked up all kinds of stuff. I'd go to record shops and I remember in Turkey, I picked up, this is how long ago it was, I picked up a handful of cassettes uh -huh. of some of the religious music that you, you would never find. I mean, on the internet now, it's, it's a lot easier, but you would never find that in Tower Records back in the day. So right. I just love that stuff. And I, I think I got triggered from watching Tarzan movies as a kid. The whole African percussion thing when they're out in the jungle, it's just very intriguing. In fact, one of my all-time bands ever is Weather Report. Mm -hmm. And there's such ethnic influence with that stuff. So, yeah, I like that. And then the last record, Whatever, which if you're from Southern Cal, is pronounced Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that, almost all of that was written for Jeff Beck. Okay. And when I joined his band, he was really into electronica, and he turned me on to that stuff. A lot of people think I was the influence there, but it was the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was just thinking electronica, disco, blah. But, you know, there's, in any genre, there, there's always the cream of the crop. Mm -hmm. And he turned me on to Prodigy and maybe Crystal Method and that kind of stuff. And it, it really woke me up because I was really searching for something inspiring at that time. And I really got into that. And that's when uh, he started recording with Pro Tools and had a really interesting way to go about it. And so I ended up with a Pro Tools system, and that's what got me into computer recording. Mm -hmm. But um, all but maybe one or two of those tunes were written for him huh. at that time. I, I spent a lot of time recording, because he always wants more material, more material. He has a very voracious appetite for new stuff. Right, right. The first time I saw you play live was actually in Oakland at a theater there with Jeff Beck. And, I, and as I recall, you were playing a lot of guitar synth at that time. You were kind of filling the yeah. role of both guitar and keyboards in that. In that yeah, moment. that was trial by fire. You know, I had had a, one of the Roland synths prior to that and just kind of messed around with it. Didn't go through the manual, but I would just grab sounds and mess with it. And all of a sudden I'm with him and he had a kind of a couple days of playing around in New York City. And at that time, it was 2011 on bass, Terry Bozio. Um, and I walked in, and there was no keyboard player. And I'm going, hmm, there's <laughs> something wrong here. And he was totally happy to have me only play guitar. And I thought, with his back catalog, there's no way. Mm -hmm. With Max Middleton, Jan Hammer, all those sounds, Tony Hymas, guitar is just not going to cut it. So at that time, I, I ended up with a, an Axon uh, MIDI system. Right from the Frankfurt show, which was at that time the fastest in the world. And, but I didn't like the sounds in it. So then I got rolling 1080s for sounds and the two systems did not work well together. Mm -hmm. I had to have all kinds of squawks and squeals and you know, go for strings and trumpets would pop out or C chord. <laughs> all of a sudden there's a sharp nine flat five I did not intend. <laughs> so I ended up with all rolling gear for the tour and at least half of my gig was triggering synth pads. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a really good entrance into it, being forced, right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And at that time, it, I had two modules, well, three really, because I had a spare. But if I wanted to combine sounds, uh, the unbelievable amount of hours went into, okay, here's the sound, and then tell it, I want it on the E string, B string, G string, all the way down, then add another layer, and if I didn't like the combination, then it'd start over. Right. You know, oh. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad technology has advanced in well, many ways. Well, you mentioned the, the Fishman triple play system, and now it's so easy. It's all right in your laptop, right? And it's yeah. wireless. Yeah, you just plug in and go the yeah. way it should be. Yeah. It's, it's wild that it has taken so many years, but it's finally here. Technology's here, yeah. So, I, I mean, I take a laptop anywhere I go anyway. Mm -hmm. So 
and, and you know, just a MacBook Air, or you can even have an iPad, and it's got more sounds than I had in an entire refrigerator size rack right. back then. Um, and it responds so much quicker. Mm -hmm. I mean, back in the day with him, there was sometimes I had to do solo lines. Like there's a, I think in Savoy, there's a, a trumpet line or horns. And I'd have to be so on top of the beat to, to have the sound come out properly. Um, I, I just hated that part. The pads were, were okay. But now you can play like a guitar player. And now it reacts to every little nuance that you do. Finger bands, vibrato, um, you name it. It's, mm -hmm. it's so fast. I, in fact, I like to, in the demo, I like to take half step apart and go brrrr as fast as I can go, and it's there. Right. It tracks, so right. it's a whole new world. And bass, that's something that, forget about it 20 years ago, uh, it's just impossible. You play a note, bing, then the sound happens. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to groove that way. Right, so, right. One of the things I do in my demo is Jocko's Teen Town, because uh, that, that's pretty quick, and it's, it's just right there. Nice, nice. Do you do much tapping with it? I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't. Um, I haven't spent much time with it. I'm sure there's certain sounds that are better than others, sure. but I, I think it responds better to a pick. Right. Yeah, it likes that, that attack yeah. to trigger the note. Yeah. All right. So circling back, how did you make the connection with Jeff Beck? How did you end up uh, playing with him? I stalked him. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was such a fan. And, you know, long before the Internet, it wasn't so easy to find information about him. I remember staying up late at night because I knew an interview was coming. And uh, it was like 4 o'clock in the morning for him. And I just remember I had moved into a new apartment flat on my back just listening to the radio because it's magic. God is speaking at right. 9 o'clock. <laughs> right. Um, I I ended up befriending Terry Bozio at one point, so that was the connection because he had been playing with Jeff at that time. And it seemed like everybody I talked to, NAM shows, oh, Jeff was just here. Did you see him? No! <laughs> you know, and it's like one thing after another. Um, so at, on the Bad Tour, <clears throat> there was a guy playing keyboards, Rory Kaplan, that had worked with Jan and Jeff on one of the tours. And he goes, oh, you're into Jeff, I'll, I'll introduce you. That didn't happen. So then I find we're doing another tour, the Dangerous Tour in 92. I knew we were going to England. So it was the goal of that tour to meet him and get an autograph. And every country we went to, there would always be Sony reps hanging out after the show. And I'd ask everybody, anybody got a connection to Jeff? And finally somebody came through and uh, got him VIP parking and tickets for Wembley Stadium when we were in London. And two opening bands went on, and then Michael canceled of oh, all the days <laughs> of the tour. So it turns out Jeff was turned away at the gate, and <laughs> I called him next day and said, you know, I don't know when or if they're going to make up the, the tour but, or that date, but can I meet you anyway? And he said, sure. So I came down. He was recording at the Townhouse Studios in London doing the Rockabilly record mm -hmm. at that time. So I met him, got my autograph, um, gave him a copy of my first CD that had just come out, and also, MTV in London or England was, was playing the Flight of the Bumblebee video. So I, I had just gotten a copy of that, so I gave that to him. I thought, great, my connection is made, check off the bucket list. Um, never expecting to ever see him again, and he called me up a couple months later and said, I finally had a chance to listen to your record and let's do a record together. So, of course, I just peed my pants immediately. I mean, <laughs> right. that doesn't happen. Right, <laughs> so, right. <laughs> And it was actually five years later before it happened. In the meantime, I had seen him. He did a double tour with Santana and some other tour. And every time I'd see him, he'd go, we're going to do this thing. And I thought, you know, I know what it's like to be inspired this moment. And then a year later, you're on to other things. Right. But it happened. He called me up finally and said he had an a extended tour of Italy. He wanted to break the new band in, in Italy. And I had never played with him, and he just had faith. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and by that time... It was after the Dangerous Tour, so I had two records out at that time. And, um, you know, he's just, here's the dates, let's go. And I, prior to that, I was doing these techno sessions in Italy, and I thought, okay, I'm close enough. I'm going to, like, force an audition on myself in his presence just to make sure he's not nuts, you know? <laughs> <laughs> in the meantime, I'm not telling anybody about this. And I learned most of the stuff on Guitar Shop and then just went to his house and played along with the record, just just to have that moment and the bond and so anyway I ended up playing with him for three years and being part of two records. It's awesome. Yeah. 
That's really awesome. You yeah. mentioned that uh, he and Joe DiOrio are your favorite guitar players. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty disparate pair of guys there. Yeah. You know, uh, the intervallic designs thing and everything that Joe DiOrio well, did. Well, the thing that brings them together is innovation yeah. and originality. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I have a bit of both of them in my playing as well as uh, taking off tons of solos. Right. Anything from Charlie Parker and Coltrane to George Lynch and Van Halen and... Lots of lots of Jeff stuff. I learned every solo on Blow by Blow and Wired mm -hmm. at one point. So yeah, that that was a wonderful experience. I mean, it, it's one thing to be on stage with them and playing. There's there's another level to them when there's no pressure and it's at at rehearsals. And I've heard them play stuff you'll never hear. Yeah. I mean, country picking like you wouldn't believe, um, and even jazz. Mm -hmm. I that blew my mind. We were gonna do Goodbye Pork Pie Hat. At, Acoustically, I think, and we never did it live, but the the vocabulary was completely different. Hmm. It, it blew my mind. Yeah. So that was really insightful. And then, of course, you know, living on a bus with people, you really get to know him and hearing his thoughts on music. I, and a lot of times in the studio, I'd be thinking, ah, why do I need to be here on a Jeff Beck record? You don't need another guitar player on a Jeff Beck record. Although I did play some stuff, but there'd always be. One one thing he'd say every day that was like, boom, the heavens open up, and I'll never forget that for the rest of my life. Wow. wow. Like, like one thing I remember is um, he said, man, if the, if the drums are right, if the groove is right, you don't need much else. And the rest of us are trying to put everything we know on every record, and he, you know, right. he spoon feeds it. That's all that's needed there. Right, right. So that there was a lot of wisdom imparted in Incredible. three years. Incredible. Yeah. I'm envious. Well, that, that, that's amazing. Next life. <laughs> there you go. We can hope. We can hope. So, what's happening? What are you? What are you up to these days? Ah, uh, globe trotting like crazy. I mean, the last couple of weeks have been insane. I, I was in Europe and UK for uh, the last couple months, and came back, and they lost my guitar for two weeks, and missed flights and connections, and uh, I'm taking a lot of the summer off to get my brain back. Right. Um, but uh, just a huge variety of stuff. This last winter. I did a lot of recording at home, which I love. People just send me waves and apes from whatever country, and uh, I can record with my slippers on. <laughs> right, right, right. That is nice. So you can just, uh, just people are sending you files, and you're laying solos on them or parts on them. Yeah, and doing yeah. So that's great. That's great. And, and uh, uh, a fun thing too is I, I was asked to fly into Chicago a couple times for a session <clears throat> with a really fantastic singer named Mark Shear. And it's, the record's produced by Mark, uh, Jim Peterick mm -hmm. from Survivor, Grammy winner. And it's, it's uh, music I've never played before. It's, it's kind of like Foreigner, re really massive tracks. And they had me play on every track. And then Mark called me up after a while and said, you know, your guitar personality has really changed the direction of the record, so I want you to be more a part of it. So now the CD cover says Cher Batten. And it's called oh, Battlefield, nice. and it's coming out September 22nd. Oh, great. Yeah, so maybe there'll be a tour that comes out of that. It's, um, it's a good way to have a new record out because it was virtually painless. Right. You know, and my solo records is like, <laughs> like months and months, if not years, of tearing things out of me and, uh, you know, a b billion decisions that go into the mix. Right. So uh, I, I'm pretty joyful about this coming up. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, we're very grateful that Fishman brought you in, and we, we appreciate you taking time to come out to GearFest and enjoy the weekend with us and all everything that's going on. I, I'm thrilled to be here. I, I saw what it looked like online, and I go, holy crap, this is not just a warehouse. This is, no, this is a <laughs> complex. This is like the apple of music. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, and, it's pretty, uh, have you been I, down the slide? No. No, you got to no, go I, I haven't even had the tour yet. Oh, well. But I have had many a Tootsie Roll from this place. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate the orders. Thank you very much. That's great. That's great. And thanks so much for being here. It's really been yeah, uh, my pleasure. Been, it's been a gas. Great to have you here. Cheers. And thank you for joining me at GearFest 2017. I'm Mitch Gallagher.